you own a small business and it ain't easy and it may be going okay or you could be stuck and barely making ends meet it's about time for a pivot welcome Welcome to to small Small business Business Pivots. pivots it's time for you to generate some cash some real cash some real cash How does a million sound? Only 9% of small businesses earn over a million bucks annually. But your host is a business coach and an entrepreneur. And we're going to talk to the small business owners who've done the million dollars and more. It's time to be inspired. Welcome to the Seven Figure Club. This is Small Business Pivots. And now your host, Michael Morrison. Yes, I am your host, Michael Morrison. I'm a passionate small business coach who helps small business owners who are working hard and not getting anywhere. Having owned numerous businesses myself, I've walked in your shoes and know from experience the things that you need to know to build and scale your business. If you'd like to explore how a small business coach could help you and your small business succeed, go to my webpage, michaeldmorrison.com. And if you want to schedule a free consultation with me to learn more about how a small business coach could help you, click the Let's Chat button in the top right-hand corner. Or if you're just looking for additional resources for your small business success, check out my other company, Boss. The URL for that company is businessownershipsimplified.com. And there you will find small business resources for online classes, master classes, books, additional coaches, culture building tools and exercises, networking events, and much, much more. Our guest today is Will Blake. Will owns several enterprises spanning from construction to software. He is committed to redefining the home improvement world through leadership development, coaching businesses, and creating products designed to help the world of construction. He and his wife, Sydney, operate a growing foundation repair business, repairing over 60 homes a week. And for those that know Will, he is a flurry of ideas and enthusiasm. He has many humbling stories of his past failures that he gladly shares and wears with pride. So let's get to our guest to hear those stories that has contributed to his seven-figure success and more. Welcome to the show, Will Blake. How are you today? Michael, I'm great, man. I uh, we, we are running around like crazy, just living life and family and business and just trying to, you know, they say, try to enjoy the journey. I've never been really good at that. So, but I'm <laughs> trying my best to. So, uh, yeah, I'm great. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. So you're telling me even when you build an empire, you still run around. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately. <laughs> well every small business owner needs to hear that but you run around in a different way because you're a little more organized than most small business owners who get stuck they plateau in their business and that's the purpose of our show is to kind of bring them a voice of hope and some light at the end of the tunnel of uh, some things that they can do to get past that hump that they're stuck at and so I know there's a question that most of us were asked as a young person. It seems like every teacher asks, what do you want to do when you grow up? What was that thing you wanted to do when you grew up? Oh, man. So uh, ironically, I wanted to be an architect. Hmm. My father was a general contractor, and I was very good at drawing. But, um, you know, you have to be actually really smart to get into a school to become an architect. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't have those ladder qualifications. (laughs) I'm with you. I'm on your team. (laughs) So probably like a lot of young men, I picked up an instrument in high school. Of course, you do that because it's like, yeah, you want to be cool and attract the girls. So I played drums through most of my young adult life and I wanted to be a rock star. You know, I was going to be playing on stage in front of thousands of people and having fun. And I got to the point with a, a group of friends in high school. We got signed in a demo deal to Interscope Records thinking we were going to be rock stars. And as many probably know or don't know, we drove around in a broken down RV, <laughs> made no money for two years. And I'm very glad that I checked that box off in my life. And I can say that I was not a musical success or a rock star. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, you weren't a rock star in the musical world, but you are in the business world. So I want to kind of jump back because we know you and I both know that small business owners, we get stuck. And a lot of times it's in our head. 
And so I know for myself, I can relate to you because I was not studious, if you will. And so I had to find other avenues to kind of release my well-being, my strengths and things like that, which mine was sports. And of course, I wanted to be a rock star too. I bought the mm-hmm. Ace Freely type looking guitar and started growing my hair out long. And yeah, yeah. I failed at that too. So <laughs> I think we That's all- okay. New series will be the boss tribute band and you can play the guitar. I'll play the drums. We'll get a few of your other guests. We'll make a show of it. So, well, but I want people to watch. <laughs> oh yeah. Good point. Yeah. <laughs> um, so as a young person, what were some trials and tribulations? Did you have any mindset issues? And if you did, if you didn't, that's great. But if you did, then what were some pivots you made to overcome those to get where you are today? Yeah, and, and specifically in my younger days, um, I, I I'm a middle child, so I don't know if any of your listeners can relate to it, but you know I was I'm a middle child too for some type of. Oh, cool! So you can relate. Yeah, <laughs> yes. I, I was always jockeying for that, call it uh, authority or uh, success that either my older brother or younger sister had. So that made me rather defiant. Um, in regards to if I if I couldn't get something done, I would just swing to the totally other end of the expect spectrum and dive deep into whatever I was working on, ignore everything else that mattered. And then, um, you know, that led to a lot of successes in life because it made me tenacious, but it also, it didn't make me efficient, which I later found out is, you know, you can work hard and not get very far. Um, right. I, I was the opposite of work smarter, not harder. I was work harder, not smarter. And uh, you know, in my adult life, I found out uh, as a challenge to my leadership team to be tested for ADHD. And uh, I I was never good in school, but I, I scored an ace on that test. <laughs> <laughs> and then I found out, oh, that's probably why I was like that in my younger days. So it, right. it's just kind of funny to laugh about it now. But uh you know, that, that's carried over into my uh, businesses today and all my little projects. And uh, I, I have a good set of bumpers, like in the bowling alley, mm. uh, called my leadership team and my wife that keep <laughs> me in the lane. But boy, I'm bouncing down that lane so fast <laughs> some days. So, But yeah, that's, that's a little bit about, you know, what kind of attitudes and mindsets got me to where I am today. So... Well, you're you're bouncing around from rail to rail, but you're knocking down a lot of pins. So let's talk about all those wins that you're getting. And um, so you own Vesta Foundation Solutions. So what got you into that? As Mike Rowe would say, that sounds like a dirty job. But yeah. what would you what got you into that? Yeah, it's it's funny. Nobody wakes up and says, Man, I want to be a foundation repair contractor today, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mom, dad, I, I got my dream laid out. So uh, it's funny uh, when growing up, my father was obviously a general contractor and and he was like, listen, you got to go to school. You got to go to college. I don't want you to be in construction, you know, like me your whole life. And uh, as probably many parents gave guidance to their kids to, you know, go to college. Uh, well, I was never really good at high school, so that obviously translated to my first two years of college, which was really uh, a, a great experiment in how to make uh, C's and D's, but paying for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, and the one thing that tipped the scale was uh, that time, at that time, my my girlfriend, now wife, Sydney, um, we, we'd been dating several years, we We were young and 20 and we got the, uh uh-oh, we're pregnant moment. So finding out I was going to be a 20-year-old adult parent Mm. uh, with responsibilities, I said, oh gosh, I got to, I got to provide for this new family. And uh, so first thing I did was just jump back into what I knew. I knew construction. Um, So I, I did work uh, for a little bit for my father, just uh, on particular projects that he needed. But then I created my own company thinking, you know, I'm just going to own my own business. Right. And I didn't even know what LLC stood for. (laughs) (laughs) Do you you yet? (laughs) Yeah. yeah, It's just so funny. Like I look back and I, I wish I could just smack my 20 year old self upside the head. 
but you know, that, that actually taught me, you got to learn it. And uh, what better way to learn to swim than be thrown in the ocean, right? So yeah. I, I started a business at 20 and I did a whopping, let me see here, $31,000 in my first year. Woo. Gross. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the net was way worse. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it, and I built that up and then eventually found a, uh, a gentleman that was uh, looking at retirement. And he was specifically in a, a space, uh, just so you know a little bit about my background, I'm from North Carolina, originally a little small mountain town called Boone. And there, there's a lot of dirt crawl spaces, meaning homes that have a space with dirt and exposed framing and that you crawl under. And uh, he was in that space and our businesses complemented each other really well. We ended up merging our business and... At that time, that introduced me to a little bit more sophistication around my weaknesses. This partner was a little bit smarter on the financial side, understood a little bit more about systems and processes, even though we were both very novice level. That introduced me to a little bit more sophistication that I didn't know existed. Um, he was more compliant. I was obviously a little bit more outgoing. Um, and uh, we grew that business from 300,000 up to 9 million in the course of seven years. Wow. And that was my first lesson in contract law and young, arrogant leadership. <laughs> I, uh, you know, the fact is, is I was a 27 year old and I would still say to this day, a kid running a $9 million company. And I really didn't know what I was doing. I had no real leadership skills. Um, had a lot of ego. And because of that, we, we ended up separating that, that partnership. And at the time it was devastating, but now looking back, it was the best thing that could have happened because, you know, I needed to have that big slice of humble pie. Yeah. And, and I needed that my ego taken down a notch. And then also that gave me an opportunity to then venture out and say, okay, I really failed at this. I spent seven years of my life and I, I felt like a failure, but now it's like, well, I got plenty of time left in life. Hopefully at 27, right? At 27, you think you, you, oh man, life's already over. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, at that time I went around, uh, my wife and I would help other companies in the contracting space, set up systems and processes. And then a good friend of ours in Virginia heard that Sydney and I were uh, on the market, so to speak. And he said, Hey, listen, I want you to come up here and I want you to work for me. He at that time, he had three offices doing about 30 million in revenue per year. Um, and I actually was really mesmerized by this gentleman that was his VP. His name is uh, Joseph Rusk, just very charismatic, very inspiring leader, uh, really just intelligent. His attention to detail, not only from an IQ, but an EQ perspective was just amazing. So we relocated to Virginia and I got to work directly under the leadership of uh, the VP, Joe. And then Sydney worked on the database administration side of a software product they had. And we grew that company up until about 70 million in revenue. And we were specifically in the foundation repair space. And then at that time, he... Uh, after about 70 million in revenue, he sold that company to private equity, which uh, honestly was the best thing that could have happened because yeah. that business was like holding a tiger by the tail. It was just <laughs> so massive. And uh, we helped that company transition to the new leadership and uh, we were happy to, it had outgrown a lot of us. And uh, we had this opportunity uh, to go back home to North Carolina and one of our vendors approached us and said, Hey, listen, uh, we would really like to have the opportunity for you to open a market uh, in some areas where we're struggling. And um, there was about 15 open markets and um, we, we ran business plans for all of those. And to be clear, my business plans is simply going to word, typing in business plan in the template, and then it spits it out and I just fill in the <laughs> blanks. So, yes. but that, that gave me a, a an avenue to, go through the thought process of exercising, hey, is this a good business or not? Is this a good market or not? So we relocated uh, in the beginning of 2000, uh, sorry, end of 2016 to Oklahoma City to open up a foundation repair company. Mm -hmm. And we just wanted to 
just do the same thing we've been doing for now over 12 years and then just try to have fun doing it. So we, we know how these systems and processes work. We're, we, without sounding too arrogant, we're pretty good at it. But mind you, Michael, you couldn't put me in a retail shop or a restaurant. I would bankrupt that place in a heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> so you but, know your uh, lane. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, well, it, it, and I some still venture out of that lane, but not to such great risk or, um, you know, I'm, call it size is our company best is now. So we currently, just to fast forward now, as of this recording, we have 74 employees. We have an office in Oklahoma City. Uh, one in Springdale, Arkansas, and Dallas, Texas. And we'll probably top out. We're, we're now in six years of business at the end of this year, and we'll top out a little over $15 million in um, revenue. Wow. And uh, we're just chugging along and just trying to have fun doing it. And that's where I, I have to put myself in check. It's like, yeah, this is supposed to be fun. And some days it's not. <laughs> but when I back up from it, it is fun. And when people look at our success, they don't realize that I've actually kind of screwed it up for the last 17 years. And now I just finally got it right. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So, but, uh, well, but yeah, hopefully that gives you some background. Oh no, that's, that's full of nuggets there. So one of the things that's not often mentioned is humility. And so I love that you're, you expose that because being a young adult in your twenties, Coming across like myself, I was in my 30s when I first hit my million dollars in annual revenue, and I thought I was it. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought I had it down. And then, of course, you know, life changes and you get smashed in the face a few times, <laughs> bloody <laughs> nose, all that good stuff, you know. Yep. Uh, and I'll never forget uh, getting humbled. And I think that not just failing and fail fast, I also think that humility and being humbled at least once as you grow a business is critical to getting it right the next time. Would you, yeah. what, would you expand on that? Yeah. You know, it's funny you mentioned that because it is, uh, you know, I remember like when, when we hit our first million in revenue back in North Carolina, I was like, man, how could we be any bigger? We are just giants. Yes. And I'm like, what an arrogant a-hole. <laughs> I'm with, man, and, our stories align too oh, much. Gosh. I, and it's funny. There was one year we hit 5 million. It was like, awesome. We hit 5 million. We are rock stars. Then if, I think it, two years later, we went down and then that 5 million the second time didn't feel as good. <laughs> it's like, First time it hit five million is great. Second time, not so great. But it's yeah. uh, that that's one of those where it kind of like it, it puts you in a good spot. And uh, you know, there's I think when we talk about like a defining humble moment that kind of resets your ego, I find that like we all have to have that, I think, to make us get to the next level, you know. And I think we all probably have that in our lives or can relate to it. Uh you know, um, we had a really big scenario here at our company last year that pushed the boundaries of my leadership team. It was related to an injury and it really shook them up. And while I wasn't happy that that injury and everybody was OK, by the way. But the fact is, is like they needed to go through that and realize, oh, wow, like we haven't really been keeping our eye on the ball. Hmm. And to know that they had that call it space to screw it up is really big for us in our culture. Cause well, I think you can relate like in school, you get graded and you get beat down for if it's wrong. Right. But in life, it's the opposite. You know, if you get it wrong, then great. You get to go do it right now. And, yeah. you, uh, and I tell my team like, Hey, no banker has asked for my report card. So we're good. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, yeah. And, and I hate to think it in your parent, Michael, uh, I, I hate to think about that for my sons. My I've got an 18 year old and a 10 year old. And I'm like, I see the greatness in them, but I know like, man, the only way they're really going to kick it into gear is they got to have some defining moment that really knocks them on their butt Ooh. and makes them recalibrate. And I know that moment's going to come and I want to protect them from it, but they really need that. Um, yeah. So that's so, kind of my mindset around it. Yeah. I, I totally agree. You hate to see your, your kids learn a lesson 
But as I always say, my greatest lessons learned are failures and mm-hmm. we have to go through them. So for small business owners that are listening, failures are awesome. <laughs> I, mm-hmm. I hate to say it like that, but it truly is because it's really a defining moment. Like you said, it could be, it could be that pivot point. You know, my pivot point, uh, many know that I had to file bankruptcy and, and I'm proud mm-hmm. of that because it taught me a lot of things, taught me what's worth, really worth in life. I was in a business partnership that imploded a uh, very multi-million dollar company, 75 plus employees. And it just imploded because it was a cancerous business partnership and the company filed bankruptcy. I filed bankruptcy, another business partner filed, but man, did I ever come out more alive in life from that? Mm -hmm. I remember you telling me that story a few years ago and you had like a smile on your face and I'm like, (laughs) did I? (laughs) Well, it wasn't like a a big grin, but it was, it was like, yeah, like this was a disaster, but man, then it led to this problem and this problem, but you know, this is where I'm at now and I'm glad I went through it. And I'm like, yeah, I I wouldn't be that happy, but you know, it works that way. Right. Like I'm the same way about my problems. Like, uh, I think Robert Kiyosaki coined it the best. I can't remember what book it was, but he said, if you're going to lose, lose like a Texan, lose (laughs) so bad that you can just brag about it to your buddies. Like, yeah, yeah, I totally lost a hundred thousand dollars in that stupid decision. (laughs) (laughs) I'll never forget one of my administrators. Uh, She came to me, Heather. She said, why are you the only one that's not matter than you know what in this whole entire building <laughs> yeah <laughs> but you know like i said i know it's a learning lesson uh yeah. I, it was meant to be and and i've come out and now i help other business partnerships uh rekindle their relationship or figure a way to get out and so a lot of partnerships come to me now because i've been on both sides successful and failing failing and so i kind of know some of those key elements that are required for a successful partnership. So you also mentioned systems and processes. So I, you know, I'm all about SOPs. I I preach it. It's one of the three things you have to have in a successful business. One is guiding principles. You've got to have a North star. You got to have strategy. You got to have all those elements in place. You have to have SOPs and then you have to have the right people. Uh, and people is not just your employees. It's bankers, it's contractors, supplier. You got to have that supporting staff team as well. But systems and processes is so critical to replicating, you know, uh, systems and processes in your business. You have a software coming out or that's just launched. Why don't you share that? Because I think that's what it's really all about, isn't it? Yeah. And and it's funny you mentioned about like the stages you you were talking about North Star. And I talk a lot of people about this, like you have to have a vision, right? Uh, Which is like what you're saying, that North Star. And then processes complement the vision. And then third, ironically, you said the people. And uh, that's that's huge for us in our businesses and especially for the blue collar space. You know, if we've got a grandiose target, say 10, 20 years down the road, we've got the vision set. We've got processes ironed out. We're tweaking them. Well, now the only thing that could help or hinder that is the people. And so in my space, in 2000, not my space like the software, but in my industry, um, I noticed the writing on the wall in construction that, hey, we're going to have a tough time finding people um, and holding on to them because we have so many people aging out of construction. At that point, it was 18 percent of our workforce was going to age out and only 12 percent coming back in to backfill wow. it. And that's spread across all industries. So it's going to be dog eat dog. We're all going to be fighting over people. And um So I started focusing on that in 2019. It was like, how can I improve the culture and the retention of my team? And so we started diving into systems around, um, well, how do we really develop an employee? How do we create a relationship, a professional one? And how do we check in with that employee? And how do we communicate in a way that they understand? Because we have Gen Zs to boomers here in our company, and they all communicate in different ways. And there's value and strength in there. And then COVID happened, which threw everything out the window. Yeah. And so uh, we actually reconfigured our recruiting and employee uh, engagement within our company. And it has helped. I mean, through the hard times and the labor shortages, we have not had trouble 
finding people. We actually have a surplus. We call it a bench of people waiting for open positions. And mind you, back to this, I'm in foundation repair. I'm not, right. <laughs> I'm not in sexy work. Like it's going to be 103 today. And our people are running out the door with smiles on their face. Wow. And uh, so we took this, uh, mind you, a few years ago. I wanted to do this a few years ago. My lovely wife said, no, you are crazy. You are not doing that. Mm. <laughs> so chewing away little by little, uh, I ended up uh, finally taking the leap, uh, creating a software called Unison, which is driven for deskless workforces, meaning the construction companies, the agriculture companies, the people that have mobile employees that aren't sitting in a computer every day. And what it did is it really packages together in a mobile centric application, uh, assistance with recruiting, team management and uh, goals, um, and essentially engagement and how we communicate and we share kudos and we also uh, can do impulsive anonymous surveys through that system so we can get feedback from our employees in real time. Hmm. And that's been just a really cool journey to not only develop it, but see it implemented now. And our team loves it because, you know, it is completely separate from my foundation repair company. It's now a software business on itself. But they've got this buy-in of knowing that they're helping us create it, which is just really cool, which then in itself is a process. So yeah. we just can the process into an application. And now we're helping other companies in our space around the country, you know, implement these same processes in their businesses. So it's, it's just been really cool. And uh, it's called Unison. Uh, the title of our business is Unison Works with an X at the end. Okay. And uh, yeah, we, we are full launch right now. And uh, much like your busy schedule, the next two weeks is nothing but um, onboarding different companies on this platform. And it's just been, man, it's been fun. It's been really, it's been scary, but fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, um, discomfort means you're growing, right? Mm -hmm. So about this, so would you say it's a good resource for pretty much any contractor, like plumbers, electricians? Is that the type of businesses you're talking about? Yeah. And, and we do have a few companies that are not in our space that are on it right now. Like I have a small insurance uh, company, uh, open market insurance company that just has six people in their office and they just want to make sure that they're keeping consistent with communication and, mm -hmm. uh, and that they're testing it. It's not my, my specific ideal customer, but yeah, my, my purpose in life is to help the construction world. So like call it, Joe's plumbing service where Joe is the plumber and he's running around in his van with six employees, you know, having the ability to communicate and engage and hold on to those employees. Those are the people I'm trying to help. Okay. You know, because, um, you know, Joe, the licensed plumber, he's really good at, you know, running that, that job or doing the plumbing and helping maybe a journeyman get up to his license, but he's not good at recruiting. Yeah. And he's not good at like holding people accountable to having performance reviews for their people. So it reminds, say that example of Joe, the plumber, Hey, like Jimmy is just got his apprentice license. He's ready for his journeyman's. Like you need to make sure you have a check-in with him, make sure you get those applications and it automates it. Um, but yeah, we've got companies from uh, Mississippi to North Carolina, all the way up to New Jersey and back around the Midcon region of various, um, like commercial residential, uh, we've got a few, uh, companies that are in the, uh, pardon, uh, waterproofing space, uh, where they have waterproofing services on houses. So it's been really cool to see how each different company integrates with it. And we're really excited because, uh, we're hoping that it, we can onboard, say, for example, electricians have a, a licensing system called CIB. And they gave me this manual and it's, yeah, I mean, it's two inches thick wow. and I'm like, oh man. So we're actually embedding that into unison. So when an electrical company comes on board and they hire a new employee, it automatically has the next three years of that employee's licensing timeline built into it. Wow. And uh, so that that's just my purpose because I, I feel like we're going to be in trouble here in the next decade. If we don't have people that can fix our homes and can fix our buildings, you know, everything's just going to fall apart. And the people that the only people that can afford 
to get their buildings fixed will be, yeah. you know, uber wealthy. And then that leaves a big gap of where everything we see around our society is held together by people that repair them and make them. Yeah. And that's just my, my purpose. So Unison and my company Vesta, and we have a camp for kids uh, called construct my future around the trades. All of it is just built around trying to help construction companies. So I don't well, know how many of your listeners are there, but that's that's kind of the that's this little kitty pool I play in. Over yeah, here, so. well, that's, yeah. That sounds like you're in the deep end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, some days it is. <laughs> so is there a website for well, first of all, I'm going to encourage small business owners in in any of those spaces to go check this out because I know for a lot of contractors and construction companies. They are not automated. They're not streamlined. They're still doing things the old way. Now is the time with this software, because I've checked it out. You kind of gave me a little sample. And um, now is the time to to venture into that space, or you're going to get left behind. I mean, I, that's there's just no way about it. Like you said, 10 years from now, if someone's looking to start a business, because some of our listeners are considering what business to start, if you want something that's going to kind of for longevity, I would say the construction space, because right now, currently while we're recording, AI is a big thing. Chat GPT is a big thing. And it's it's already taking out a lot of human jobs, a lot of elements of that humans do. But construction, I just don't see, I'm not going to say never, but I just don't see there being a computer or robots or something that can do stuff the entire process and and then fix things, repair, you know. So you're onto something, I I believe. And so the website, what is the website that they can go check it out? Um, it is called Unison Works. That's W O R X dot com. Okay. And, and Unison um, is spelled U uh, N I S O N. Like okay. in Unison, like we're getting all of our team in Unison. That's, okay. that's the meaning behind the name. But, uh, yeah. you know, it's funny you mentioned that about AI. Like we're, we're looking at like, how do we integrate with AI and construction? Because a robot's not going to be able to fly into a building and take out that ceiling tile and inspect for damage. But, you know, a, a foreman could go in there with the assistance of a robot, which, you know, many companies are creating such cool stuff, but it still yeah. takes an individual to utilize, mobilize and execute on that. But, uh, it's funny you mention about going like if we don't get on these systems and processes specifically in construction about how we communicate with Gen Z. Yeah, we, we, we're companies are going to be in trouble. And it's going back to what you mentioned about your North Star processes, people. I, I navigate amongst five things that are big challenges for small businesses. One, one is vision, which you mentioned. Mm -hmm. The second one is processes. So how do you replicate you in the business? That's processes. And then when you get those processes set, then you got the people. Unison is meant to be the people facet. Mm -hmm. And then this last two would be uh, finances. And how do you understand how money works in a business? And most business owners, they hit that roadblock at some point and they either get through it or they turn around and go back. Um, because of the fear of going bankrupt or failure. And then the last one is leadership and culture, because that's what ties everything together. So, you know, when we look at our business and I speak to other business owners, it's those five areas, very similar to what you coach um, with your with your consultancy, Michael. And Unison is really de developed around helping with the people and the culture. Hmm. And it's worked wonders for us. We, we've got an awesome retention rate and we we have people on our bench that are waiting to come into work for us. And it's like, yeah, this is how it's supposed to work. So, yeah, very cool. So you mentioned systems and processes, and I think our listeners understand how critical those are. If someone doesn't have those, cause it sounds daunting. Uh, it sounds like a lot of work and it is, I'm not going to lie. It's a lot of work, but the hardest part is just doing your first one. So what would you suggest? Do you remember going back? Cause you're, you're an expert or, you know, a specialist in that area. Where would someone start if they haven't already? Yeah. So um, depending on who you are, or what industry, I would first say, if you don't have any systems and processes, go to your vendor, because I bet you they do. Yeah. That that vendor knows how to sell their products to people to what make, well, for example, you as a business owner sell more of their product. Right. So a lot of vendors already have good systems and processes that they're willing to share. And then... Um, 
I've done this in the past where I've called a competitor. I say competitor, but someone in a business like mine states a way that we will never compete against one another and be like, hey, how are you doing this? And I just spoke to someone in South Carolina the other day and we, we will never compete against one another. And it was like, oh, wow, that's a great idea. Can you send it to me? And sure, boop, in our digital world, it was like I had I had a brand new system on my phone in five minutes. And I was like, okay, now I can change the color and put my name on it and pirate this. It, it's, yeah. not, it's not plagiarism in business in that regard, unless right. it's, of course, proprietary. But I think we forget that most people like you and I and some of our trusted friends in, our, in business around us, we genuinely want to help each other. Yes. And so like go to the vendors first, then go to other businesses and be like, hey, what do you got? Can you share it with me? Can I have it? Yeah. And, uh, and we call it beg, borrow or steal, but don't <laughs> steal. <laughs> but, uh, and then uh, don't get too bogged down. I think one thing that uh, I have been mistaken, I've, I've screwed this up, Michael, and I still do it today, is just keep it simple. Yes. Um, because I overcomplicate it. And then what happens is, is the learning curve or adoption curve for somebody in the company goes way longer. And my Favorite example of processes is a scene from Tommy Boy. I'm sure many listeners have seen it where they go into the sales call and he he starts to describe this car accident situation and he crams the car into this little model car into something, then sets it on fire. And then the guy kicks him out of the office. Well, okay. that is the perfect example of a broken process. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And to be clear, I've got a good good processes, but that is happening in my business today. Somebody out there is taking my process and messing it up. It, it's just like Tommy Boy, that scene. And uh, <laughs> so when we talk about processes, it's just like, don't overthink it. I think we try to get too creative as entrepreneurs and we want to make it our own. We want to make it unique. But if we're being honest, 99.9% .9 of all the ideas out there, somebody else has already thought of it. Yeah. And we do get, we got to take our ego out of it and put ourselves in check and be like, am I just trying to inflate my persona or ego to say, I created this, or am I really just trying to create a successful business? And that's where it all comes down to. So yeah, sorry, it, Michael, it, I went on a tangent. No, I, I love it because it goes back to that humility. It's, you know, you, you don't have it figured out, you know, everything. And so we rely on other people and like you, I think that's a good point because I rely on other business coaches. Like we talk with each other. So one of the business coaches in our region, Martin Holland, who we both love, he was one of my first business coaches. He and I share papers and, you know, exercises and and thoughts and ideas together, you know, and some, some uh, clients that we have, we share. So, you know, they go to me for one thing and him for another thing. And it's all about helping others and knocking down that sense of humility to rely on others and, and be helpful. And so you're helping the construction world. I'm helping the business world. It goes hand in hand. So one thing I'd like to add on the systems and processes that you mentioned was the simplicity. So if someone is starting from scratch, if you're hiring an accountant for your business and you're writing a process for them, they should already know QuickBooks. So you don't have to tell them, push the tab and push that. And if you do, you need to find another accountant because <laughs> they should yep, know how to yep. operate QuickBooks. Uh, <laughs> you also right. shouldn't have to tell them how to categorize, you know, how to how to uh, do data entry into QuickBooks. If they yep. don't know how to do accounting, they're the wrong mm -hmm. accountant. All you're trying to do is tell them how the flow of a a project goes through your system, how it gets billed, how it gets invoiced, you know, the timelines, things like that. That's really all it is. So I wanted to kind of expand on that simplicity because I remember when I was introduced to those two decades ago, I, it was overwhelming. Mine looked like a novel for one mm -hmm. process because <laughs> yeah. I wanted to turn left, turn right, go up, go down, take two steps, yeah. uh, you know, and, and no, it's not, it's not that hard. So you, you oh, make yeah. very great points there. Yeah. Well, and people also like they when they come into your organization, they're bringing all the backlog of their past processes with them. So then if you do have something down to the letter of a process, they're going to distort it with all of their previous work experience. So right. it's OK to keep a little wiggle room in there until you finally get the jive of your company and the team 
And, uh, you know, we have a lot of fun here when we want to create a process. I used to do it all on my own, but now we, we have a lot of fun with it. There's a TED Talk called How to Make Toast. Hmm. And I would recommend anybody go watch. It's very short. And if we have an idea, it, it, it was a study done by a, a professor where they, they gave college students six postcards. And they said, we want you to draw, not speak or write, how to make toast. And it's funny, some some of the students went all the way back to like harvesting the wheat and then like and then making the bread and then putting it over. And some some people just said, like, get out a toaster, plug in the toaster, put it in. And it was all these pictures. And when we have a system and process, we give everybody a bunch of note cards uh, called nodes. And we're like, we want this process to go like this. We all draw it out and then we put it all on a wall. And then together we we talk about it, we rearrange it. And by the end, it's like, oh, there's a process. Hmm. And then somebody has been taking notes down. And then now we have quote unquote SOP, like a standard operating procedure. But that gives everybody buy-in to that process at that point, because it's a collaborative effort. Yeah. And uh I've even done this at home with my boys, like, hey, we got to have a process for who's gonna pick up the dog poo in the yard. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yes. It ain't going to be dad all the time. Right? Exactly. So we like got our little post-it notes out and there's like no speaking. Let's draw it out. Like how this is going to oh, work. Cool. And then, so we put it all up on the wall. We had probably like 20 little notes and pictures and we rearranged them in order. And then at the end of it, it was like, cool. Now we got a process for poop patrol as we call it <laughs> at the Blake house. And uh, so it's just fun and it just gets people engaged in creating the process too. Yeah. And uh, it doesn't it can be as mundane as like, how do we, you know, open up the office in the morning? Yes. We want to flip the light on, make sure the air freshener is good. Coffee pot's ready. You know, the televisions are on. And and my team knows that by now it's now it's built in our heritage. It doesn't yeah. have to be documented. It's there. So, yeah. yeah. Well, you made some more good points because I'm a big believer in the business owner should not be making the SOPs. It should be a collaborative. You know, it should be your team all helping together. And I've never heard the the picture scenario like you're talking about. That's a great idea because if you want to keep it simple, draw it out. And if you can't figure out what that drawing says, it's yeah. too complicated. Yeah. Yeah. And I it's a that. it's a great TED talk called How to Make Toast. And okay, it's, very it's amazing. Cool. It's a lot of fun. So awesome. Well, this has been fun. And believe it or not, we are out of time. And any last words of encouragement, wisdom, pivots that you'd like to share with small business owners? Well, I think uh, the first one is, um, well, Michael, thank you for having me. My pleasure. And boy, the, our time, anytime we talk, it just goes by yes. so fast. And, uh, so thank you for that. I'm, I'm excited for this, but also I know what type of person and coach you are. So I'm excited for also your clients and your listeners because you, you. you're an incredible person and you have an incredible story. Uh, I think the only thing that uh, I would, I'm naturally just impulsive and impatient. And I'm sure a lot of listeners or business owners are, but even I have to stop and say, listen, just slow down. And we're playing the long game here. Now, long game could be selling the business. Long game could be, hey, we're going to be evergreen. And we forget like, hey, we don't have to grow into a $15 million company tomorrow. If it takes 10 years, it'll take 10 years. The only reason that we would want to do that is out of ego, right? So just mm -hmm. slow it down and keep a long or infinite mindset. There's a great book called The Infinite Game by Simon Sinek, Sinek or Sinek, depending on your pronunciation of his name. That really is a great book to describe, hey, are we thinking 100 years down the road in this game of business? Or am I thinking about making payroll next week? All right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that'll untangle a lot. So hopefully that's a little bit of advice to your listeners. And if anybody wants to hear more about, you know, the circumstances that I'm sure, uh, or ask me questions, they can reach me at will at unisonworks.com. Okay. And um, I'm, it, I'll send you the information so you can put it in the description. Thank you. So is there anywhere they can follow you? Are you on social um, media anywhere? You know, I'm really bad at that. I okay, need, that's fine. So I, uh, email. Yeah. No, I, 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 we have pages for Vesta Foundation Solutions. Okay. And Unison Works. And uh, we also have, I do have a website created by my team it's called WilliamWalkerBlake.com. Okay. So they can actually go on to there. And if they want to uh, request speaking or uh, they want to even visit with me and consult in a meeting like this, I just do it openly out of fun. And they can also learn about my nonprofit, Construct My Future. 
Mm -hmm. And it's got all of my projects on that website that'll tether to all of my businesses. So WilliamWalkerBlake.com. All so. right. Excellent. Well, you've been full of information. I appreciate you. I guarantee our listeners appreciate you as well. And thanks for your time today. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. Welcome to the Recap and Coaches Corner, where I try to give you actionable items or tasks for you to carry out in your business coming straight from a small business coach that I have seen what works and what doesn't work in a business. Speaking of what doesn't work, so one of the things that Will mentioned was fail, fail fast, fail often, and why that's so critical for some of you small business owners who aren't seasoned who have, don't have very many years of business under your belt. The reason that is so critical is I was taught from a mentor many years ago where I went to him and I said, Hey, I'd like to reach out. I didn't know this person and I want to learn some of the things that to do in business. And he said, I'll tell you what, I'll set up a meeting with you. I have no problem sharing anything, but the only thing I want to share with you is what I wouldn't do what I learned, some of the mistakes I made, because you will always remember those. You'll always remember the failures and you'll always come out ahead. When you're succeeding, it's a domino effect. So it just keeps going, keeps going, keeps going until you hit the wall, get your nose bloodied, as I mentioned in the podcast. That's when you remember what not to do. And next time you won't do it again. And so it won't cost you as much time, money, resources, or whatever the tragedy was in your business. For me, it was bankruptcy. And like I said in the podcast, I'm very blessed. I've come out ahead. One of my mentors even mentioned to me after I was telling him, hey, I just got to have somebody to talk to. And he said, here's the thing, Michael. I have no doubt no doubt after two decades of being in business that you will succeed and you will succeed 10 X. And I said, I, I I'm optimistic. I believe in myself. I have a strong mindset, but why do you think that? And he said, because I'll tell you what somebody told me many years ago. And that is you've done it. Now you can do it better. And that's wisdom right there. So fail and fail fast. That's my recap with Will Blake. As far as an action item, so we talked about SOPs, and if you follow me at all, or if you don't, go to LinkedIn and let's connect. Uh, go to YouTube, Facebook, any of those places. I'd be happy to connect. But we talked about SOPs, and SOPs are critical. As you know, I talk about them all the time. And it is such a daunting idea for those that don't have them. It just sounds like a lot of work. And what I always instruct business owners who don't have the resources, they don't have a C-suite team, they don't have kind of a key employee that can help them with. What I suggest is what is that one thing every day that just crawls under your skin? It makes your blood boil. Like I am so tired of having to repeat myself. Listen to that. Repeat myself. That's where you start. It's as simple as that. There's not a right way or wrong way to create standard operating procedures for your business. Every business is in a different season of life. Some are more sophisticated. Some have 30, 40, 50 years of experience under their belt, and they have a few processes and systems in place already. So everybody's in a different place. You can go to the internet and search SOPs. You're going to find a million different templates, frameworks, ways to do it. There's not right, one right way or wrong way to do it. The best way is what works for your company. So I always suggest start with that one thing that makes your blood boil. That could be, I had one business owner recently who said, I am so tired of having to get here early before everybody else only for one reason. And I said, what's that? He said, only because no one else gets the place ready for business. So I have to make sure the lights are on, the air conditioner's on, the door, the TVs, all these things. And so I said, okay, let's, let's write a process. Well, it's not going to help Michael. And I said, well, let's just write it first and we'll worry about that next. Step one is writing it down. So what we did was we started with which door do they come in? For instance, in this building, it is the Southeast corner. Okay. Enter Southeast corner, turn off alarm, turn off the phone the offering or the night ring, I believe is what they call it. Set the air conditioner to 72, open the blinds on the west end of the office, not the east end. 
because that's where the sun rises and it makes the office. So we had this list and it was simple, five, six, seven steps. The next process was gather your team together and let's post it by the front door. Let's give everybody a copy. And for two weeks, we're going to test and trial this just to make sure that everybody has it. We're going to explore. When you come in the building, we want you to follow this. If you see any, any uh, errors in the process, tell us. We'll rewrite it. To this day, that business owner has not been the first one to show up. His team shows up, and he, it's never a problem again. Next, next SOP that we created was how to close the shop, and you just start building that. Now, I also want to encourage, as you're building these out, have some type of framework. So you could have like a header of operations, HR, marketing and sales, whatever that is. And then so you have somewhere to categorize those because you want to make it simple to find as well for your team. Because if it's complicated, if these are novels, if they're hard to understand, hard to read, hard to find, people aren't going to use them. So keep it simple. A great book, and I'll end here, is called Systemology by David Jennings. He was actually on one of our other podcasts that we have for the Boss Network. And you can find that on Business Ownership Simplified at YouTube and find the podcast video of David Jennings talking about systems and processes. It's a great video and his book is great. It's one of the simplified versions of how to create systems in your business. It, the book was also forwarded by Michael Gerber, the author of The E-Myth. So you know it's a good book there. So I hope this podcast has been helpful and we'll see you next time. You've been listening to Small Business Pivots. A lot of small business owners are feeling stuck, bogged down, barely making ends meet. But it's Michael's passion to help you change all of it. We hope you've enjoyed the show, and we hope you've gotten some useful advice from it. If you did, make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, find us on YouTube at Business Ownership Simplified. See you next time on Small Business Pivots.